the next speaker is too big for me to handle and uh, i would therefore like to hand this back uh, to mrs tiwari and uh, this is her uh, space also and uh, i am sure uh, you know that i have enjoyed every bit of it and i thank you ma'am for giving me this opportunity thank you so much jen camera is on oh okay now it's on can't help but laugh but <laughs> Uh, okay. But first of all, I, I just want to say uh, to to all our USC and uh, hi Rom. I can see that you've already uh, signed nice in. Yeah, we this past hour was uh, listening to our colleagues, uh, USC colleagues, and uh, I do want to tell you that I always find them very inspiring to hear from our own colleagues. I learn a lot from them. and uh, i think one of the things uh, one of my big realizations of course it's been there uh, is how well we work as cross functional teams because uh, almost every one of you have talked about how well you've been supported by cross functional teams uh, and some of you have actually spoken more about your other team members from other functions than you have about yourself and i think this is a very very special quality Uh, that USBI have, and uh, I really treasure it personally. So thank you. Uh, and uh, Rom, if you're ready to go, I'm ready to introduce you. As Jen said, <laughs> which is still making me laugh. But <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> let me go ahead, Rom, and uh, introduce you. Mm -hmm. Please. Okay. okay. So thank you very much for being with us here today. Uh, and uh, USPIX, I, uh, as I said earlier when we started out, uh, that this is a very inspiring story. It's a story of passion. It's a story of commitment. It's a story of ability to take risks. And when I say risk, uh, because um, you know we know Rom confronts uh, among uh, a whole variety of snakes and other reptiles. Uh, eyeballs them uh, that i don't mean just physical risk uh, but i mean also bigger risks to set up institutions uh, e which is not easy even setting up one institution is is not an easy task and it is a huge risk and he has set up several that have made a huge difference uh, to the environment uh, to to the world of reptiles and to people as well So I'm really it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ram Vitika he's affectionately known as the snake man of india and i couldn't agree more with that uh, title uh, i'm not going to tell you too much about him because i would rather he unfolds the journey but ram was born in new york city uh, he dropped out of college and uh, this was to do something which i wish i could do uh, he joined a serpentarium in miami Uh, then he moved to india in 1967 uh, and in 69 he set up the madras snake park which is famous all over india and outside of india as well uh, in india he's also worked with the irula tribe uh, and set up a cooperative and the irulas uh, some of you may know they extract venom from among the most venomous of snakes the big four uh, and which results in venom production anti venom production which has saved many lives i'm sure this was not an easy thing to do he's also set up a field station in the andaman and nicobar islands and an alliance for gharial conservation uh, on the chambal river and gharials as we know are also a threatened species uh, the rainforest research center in agumbe which we were very very happy to to visit and uh, uh, had some uh, just unforgettable experiences uh, so we were really stuck struck with the work that rom has done um, and uh, for someone who confronts such seemingly scary creatures himself is the, comes across as a very gentle uh, person not not uh, you know threatening at all himself uh, but i do want to leave you with a personal note my own i i going to slip it in here that um, reptiles are an extremely misunderstood uh, species set of species and um, very maligned uh, thanks to 
the myth and mythology and Bollywood and Hollywood and so much of others. And I know Ram's going to tell you much more about that. Uh, but please do learn from what Ram has to say and look at them in a different perspective. So with that, I'm going to hand over to the expert and I'm sure you're all waiting to hear. Thanks very much, Lena. Am I audible? Is everything okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. Now I just need to um, share the content and I'll put on my... But that was a wonderful introduction. In fact, you've told my whole story now, so all I'd have to do is show you the pictures <laughs> that go with it. Okay, so I'm the presenter now and I'm just about to start my PowerPoint presentation and we'll have a chance for question and answer at the end. Um, okay, uh, let me uh, tell you that I started very young. I was actually four years old when I caught this snake and I had one of those mothers who you can't believe how kind and how generous she was with my interests because I brought this snake home and she said, wow, how beautiful. Now, how many mothers would say that if a kid brings a snake home? Well, luckily she knew that it was a not a venomous snake and she encouraged me from the beginning and I, I have to trace my whole love for snakes and love for what I do to her. And this is just a title of what I'm about to show you. It's uh, my journey over the last half century of what I've been deeply involved in and interested in. When I was in high school in South India at Kodi Canal, I kept a pet python under my bed. I know that pets weren't allowed in school, so I had to be a little bit careful with it. But then I realized that this was going to be my profession already. And so I went to the United States ostensibly to go to college. Uh, I, I only lasted one year in college. I, I couldn't quite take academics, I'm afraid. So I got a job at uh, the Miami Serpentarium and my guru who is holding the king cobra there is William Haast. And he taught me so many things about what became my profession later in life. I came back to India in 1967. And in 69, I started the Madras Snake Park. It was a very small affair to begin with. But the chief conservator of forests of Tamil Nadu gave us a piece of land in Gindi Deer Park, right in the city. And you can see the people in the background. Suddenly, thousands of people started coming to the Madras Snake Park. The first year, we had 10 lakhs of visitors. So then I realized, hey, snakes, maybe people are frightened of them, but they're certainly a very popular animal to come and look at. And I was very lucky enough to be called to a, a tea estate in South India where a king cobra was causing problems amongst the workers there. So I helped them out by taking the king cobra out, but this became a wonderful display at the Madras Snake Park. And on top of that, uh, right early on in the uh, history of the snake park, Mrs. Gandhi came and visited. And uh, this of course raised the uh, popularity of the park greatly. And we were able to directly communicate with the prime minister about some of the conservation issues which we wanted to bring up. This was a remarkable experience. All right, so millions of people, lakhs and lakhs of people came to the snake park. But meanwhile, I had been doing some surveys around the country and found that crocodiles were going extinct. So although this picture doesn't look like it, we started with just 14 crocodiles. And now the crocodile bank, Madras Crocodile Bank, has ended up with over 2,000. And the way I put it, crocs breed like rabbits. We didn't realize that they could breed so fast but they certainly do. And like, for example, this female mugger could lay a thousand eggs during her lifetime. And this gives you an idea of what they're capable of doing. And the late Jaws III, unfortunately Jaws died last year, but he is with us for more than 40 years and he was 18 feet long. Fantastic animal. The gharial is one of the strangest, well, is the strangest of all the crocodilians in the world. And it has this long snout, specially adapted for catching and eating fish, but it was very close to extinction. And so we really started very strongly, uh, a major focus at the Madras Crocodile Bank was to breed it in captivity. And we were quite successful. In fact, we were able to breed hundreds of gharial, and we joined with the Government of India project to release them back to the wild. 
in places like the Chumbal River, where we're now doing research on them. In fact, the Garial Ecology Project on the Chumbal River, you can see that this big adult male gharial has a radio attached to its back. You see that? That's a, actually, that's a transmitter which beams a signal all the way up to a satellite. So you can, the person who's doing the research can sit at home and look at his computer and know exactly what this gharial is doing. And by finding out more and more facts about gharial, we were amazed to find that the male gharial is one of the best daddies in the world. He looks after all the babies that his harem produces, sometimes as many as Four or five hundred baby uh, garia will be looked after by the, this big daddy. You can see a bunch of them right there, all honed in on him. They know he's security, so they stay close to him. Uh, at the Croc Bank, we have wonderful uh, abil ability to teach people about crocodiles and reptiles in general. And it was wonderful that the USV Experiential Education Group came there in August 2017. And uh, it was exciting for us, and I hope exciting for them. We've gotten some very nice feedback from them on their visit. All right, just to zip over to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, I went there first in 1976, and I literally fell in love with it immediately. Who couldn't? I mean, these beautiful beaches and the rainforest. And I mean, it was just such an incredible place, but under a lot of stress in those days, there was a huge timber industry going on there. And we actually lobbied very hard to get this stopped. And it had been stopped and um, it was very, very strictly protected now. So we set up this base called the Andaman and Nicobar Environmental Team. And uh, it's gone from strength to strength. We made very simple huts for people to stay in. But please understand, working in the islands is beautiful and wonderful, but it can be pretty difficult and you need a place to stay. And that's what we realized, that if we want researchers to come and get excited and come over there and stay for longer periods of time, we had to give them a comfortable place to stay and to provide them with transport. In this case, these are dugout canoes, but we've motorized the dugouts and they're able to go from island to island. There are over 400 islands in the Andamans and to go from island to island is not that easy. You have to have a boat. And now we've been involved over these last 30, 25 years or so in the conservation of fantastic forests, a lot of underwater work with coral reefs, fish, sea snakes, dugongs, everything really, including the fisheries industry there, which where some of our researchers are doing some very interesting studies. Both my sons, Nikhil and Samir, have been doing wildlife work since they were young. I didn't twist their arms. They seem to fall into it naturally. And uh, Nikhil on the left is now the curator of the Madras Crocodile Bank. And on the right, Samir with that little pit viper is working for Fauna, Flora and Fauna International in the UK in Cambridge. All right, now to jump to something else, the Irla Snake Catchers Cooperative. As Lena just told you, I had been working with the uh, Irlas for, for a long time, since the late 60s, and found out that they were the best snake hunters in the world. And they needed some income because they were involved in the snakeskin industry, which was closed down. So with Dr. Salam Ali as a patron, we set up something called the Irla Snake Catchers Cooperative Society. And this society, since they were no longer allowed to catch snakes for the skins, and this was very important too, because snakes were being slaughtered by the millions. And it was very important to stop this industry. But then what to do for the Irlas? So we helped them set up something called the Irla Snake Catchers Cooperative, which is now the main venom supplier for the production of antivenom in India. We'll talk a little bit about snake bite toward the end of the talk, but the production of venom is so important for the production of antivenom, the only cure for snake bite. And this is how it's done. The snake, this snake, Russell's viper, is picked up carefully, gently, but firmly, and allowed to bite into a rubberized Dacron piece covering a glass and the venom, as you can see there, is uh, then collected and processed for the antivenom. And 40 years later, I'm still working with the Irlas, going out with them. We've made several films with them and uh, they're just a wonderful bunch of people. 
And uh, very interestingly, in, in 2017, the uh, United States, uh, the, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission heard about deer lust, and they said, well, maybe we need some snake catchers who really know what they're doing to come over here and help with the pythons problem in, in Florida. I don't know if you've heard about it, but people who used to keep pet pythons in Florida suddenly started letting them go out into the Everglades swamp because they got too big at home. And some of them grow to over 18 feet long. Well, Buddy Bill and Masi, the two yearlers who came over to the United States with me, we had to teach them about the local venomous snakes first, including this rattlesnake. We didn't want them to put their hands in the wrong place or catch the wrong snake. They started finding pythons, first finding shedded skins and teaching the local snake hunters how to detect where snakes are. Well, just picking up a shedded skin isn't enough. You actually have to smell it, and see, okay, this is a fresh skin. That means the python is somewhere close by. And in this case, sure enough, there was a 12 foot python very close to where we found the shedded skin. You can see the grins on their faces to see how happy they were to get such a huge snake. But then we got a 16 footer down inside an old missile bunker back in the days of the Cuban missile crisis. America had all these missile bases in Florida, and one of these huge pythons got right down inside, and it took the earless to get down inside there and find one. And they got a lot of very, very positive publicity for this. And in one day, they caught these eight pythons, which was a record. I mean, you can't imagine how many pythons are over there in the Everglades. They're causing havoc. They're eating up all the mammals and all the birds. It's just incredible. It's it's made for them, and and it's it's a couple of million hectares of swampland, so it's a very difficult place to move around and hunt. But look how successful they were. And of course, as the headline says, they made history, and uh, a lot of people very much appreciated their coming over. We're hoping to take a whole gang of them over and <laughs> and start really hunting those pythons out. All right, now I'm jumping from subject to subject, and I, I think king cobras are sort of top of the list as far as I'm concerned. I've always been absolutely fascinated with them, and they are a fascinating snake. Now, looking at it, uh, people's sort of general impression of a king cobra or venomous snakes in general is, oh my gosh, it's, it's so dangerous, oh. But actually, snakes are extremely frightened of humans. They want nothing more than to keep away from human beings. And it's us that cause the problems. It's we who cause the problems. So in the case of the king cobra, I call it an innocent animal, and an animal who wants to stay away from humans. And very few people are ever bitten by king cobras. And look at some of the color pattern and some of the colors of, uh, and how beautiful they are. This hooding, the spreading of the hood, of course, is the most distinctive thing about any cobra, including the king cobra, which really symbolizes what it is. Now, to study the snake, to find out more about the snake was really one of our important incentives, because until you know about the snake and its natural history, how do you protect it? How do you protect forests for it? So I set up the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station in 2005, and we set up again, just like in the Andamans, we set up small cottages so that researchers could come and stay there comfortably. Working in the rainforest is not easy, Sometimes there's so much rain. Well, one year we had 11 meters of rain. I mean, that's close to what Chirapunji, the, the rainiest part of India, gets. Uh, and so working in a very, very wet environment is not easy. I mean, a, a researcher needs a comfortable place to stay. Agumbe is full of fantastic creatures, including the flying lizard, or flying dragon, we should really call it. It's called Draco, which means dragon. And, but Really, to study a snake, you have to use radio telemetry. This is actually the way we do it, is actually inserting a small radio transmitter, similar to what we used on the Gariel, but that's a much bigger one. A small thumb-sized transmitter has to be inserted inside a king cobra. But the first thing you do, have to do, of course, is get one. Well, rescuing king cobras is very easy in Agumbi because people call us almost every day saying, hey, there's a king cobra in my house or in fell into my well, would you please come and get it out? The wonderful thing about the people of Agumbi is they do not kill snakes. They don't kill king cobras, especially they worship them. And by revering them, this helps us greatly. Conserv Half of our conservation problem is already 
taken care of. And king cobras get into some weird situations. They're snake eaters, and snakes come into people's houses searching for rats. And in this case, Ajay, who you see on the roof of a, someone's house here, found this king cobra up in the rafters. It was trying to catch a rat snake who had come into the house to try to catch a rat. But catching a king cobra on a roof is no joke. You can see the pipe that he's using. It's a very interesting method which he uses to bag the snake. Or in this case, the king cobra felt chilly in the morning and decided to warm himself up on top of someone's engine. Luckily, they opened the hood of the car before they took a drive that morning and found the king cobra. But you can you imagine that was quite a shock for them. So again, they called Ajay and he came and took it out. Well, th the next uh, episode of this whole journey was to invite Matt Good and Mr. and Mrs. Tiwari to see the actual process of implanting a radio inside a king cobra. And Dr. Matt Good, who you saw in the previous picture, is shown here. He's showing the vet doctor, Arun Pari, who has got, who's the one with glasses, how to implant a radio inside a king cobra. This king cobra is now asleep. We've given him uh, an anesthetic, a gas, which puts him to sleep for about half an hour so that the radio can be surgically implanted. And to track the king cobra after the radio has been put in is, of course, uh, extremely important. And we've got a lot of people volunteer to do this job, but most important of all are the local trackers, the people who actually know the forest and know as the snake is being followed, which way the trackers can follow them and the easiest way to get through the forest. It's not an easy job. For example, one male king cobra traveled 100 kilometers over a period of eight months. Can you imagine a snake traveling this distance? And the fact is that it had to travel across the entire landscape of Ugombe. You can see that it's not just forest. There's plenty of arecanut plantations, rice fields, villages, and crossing roads, which was really scary for us. Whenever we radio tracked it, when we followed the, the snake and we knew that it was coming near a road, sometimes one of us would get up on the road to stop traffic just in case one of our king cobras got run over. It doesn't happen very often, luckily. People well, for one thing, it's a pretty big snake. You can see that it covers the entire width of the road. But the wonderful thing about following one king cobra is that it leads us to other king cobras. Now, I'm not sure how many of you people know about this, but male snakes, many species of male snakes, do something called a combat dance. And they're actually fighting. This is a wrestling match, and the winner gets to mate. They don't bite each other, but they keep wrestling and wrestling and pushing the other one down and that stronger, the bigger one usually wins. Now, I'm not sure how many of you people know about this one too. Of more than 3,000 different species of snakes in the world, the only snake that makes a nest is the king cobra. This makes it so unique and so, I mean, already it's a unique species, but the fact that it makes a nest is really fantastic. You see this female has gathered up all these leaves. It took her two weeks to gather this pile of leaves and she's laid her 18 or maybe even up to 30 eggs inside the nest, and she lies on top. By lying on top, you can imagine there are not too many predators who will want to come and mess around and try to eat her eggs because, well, they'd have to face her wrath, the king cobra. When the babies finally hatch, they're actually very cute. Uh, it took about uh, 70 or 80 days for a baby king cobra to hatch. And, uh, it, it, what's very interesting is that this incubation chamber that the female makes is such so efficient and so perfect for the humidity and temperature that there is almost a hundred percent hatching rate. Almost every single egg hatches, and when the babies hatch, they are totally beautiful little creatures, and they generally climb straight up into the trees. And this makes a lot of sense because down on the ground there are a lot of predators, everything from wild boar to mongooses to civet cats, and so many different species of animals, including other snakes, would eat them because they're only very small. They're only about 12 or 15 inches long when they hatch. So the king cobra, as I said, is a snake eater. And here is an adult king cobra who's gotten a hold of a rat snake. The rat snake is trying very hard not to be eaten and bites him back. It doesn't hurt the king cobra, though. 
And the king cobra's venom will very quickly paralyze the rat snake and sw he'll swallow it. The only thing that king cobras eat other than snakes are monitor lizards, which are actually closely evolved from snakes. King cobras also eat venomous snakes, including cobras. Uh, it's very sad for the cobra, but the point is for the local people to know that king cobras are a very important snake to have around because they control the numbers of cobras and vipers and other snakes which cause so much misery and cause so many human deaths in India. So I always kind of jokingly say everyone should have a king cobra in their backyard to keep the venomous snakes away. And here's one which has uh, king cobras caught a, a, a Malabar pit viper and you can see the pit viper is biting the king cobra. He's got both of his fangs erect but the king cobra seems to have a resistance to snake venom and is not affected by the bite. All right, so at the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, we do quite a few other studies too. Not we, but the people who come, and we're a herpetologist, so we study reptiles, but a lot of people have come to study gaur, leopards, wild dogs, the lion-tailed macaque, which is a critically endangered primate, and these studies go on and on all year long. And again, we've provided a nice, safe, comfortable place for people to come and do this research. We also host international meetings and uh, we have people coming from all over the world either to do research or to come and meet with local researchers. And we also involve local students in research. This young lady, Kirti, is a zoology student at a nearby college and Coincidentally, a king cobra made a nest not even 50 meters away from her front door. Her mother and her father were pretty worried about this, as you can imagine, but she was so keen to help us that she now has, is taking temperatures every day, morning and evening, with temperature probes inserted inside the nest. We've promised her parents that we'll take the babies, king cobras, once they hatch and put them far away, and they're quite okay with that now. But can you imagine what an exciting experience it is for her? Okay, the, the tolerance I, I mentioned about king cobras uh, for the Agumbe people is great, but there are people in other parts of India who, king, who kill king cobras as soon as they see them, including uh, the areas near Vaisag and the eastern Ghats um, in the southeastern part of India on the, near the coast, not far from Hyderabad actually. So these king cobras are feared greatly by the local people. They don't have that kind of reverence they do over in Agumbe. And we are really need to teach the people over there the kind of tolerance and respect that the people uh, that Agumbe in that area have. And we've helped to do this by uh, helping a group, a, a group of filmmakers, a group of lady filmmakers called the Gaia Group to make a film called Living with the King. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to put a, a link on which you can copy so that you can actually source this film and it's available on YouTube. It show it, it's basically talked to uh, uh, interviewed the people in Agumbe people to give a message to the people over in the Eastern Ghats about how you can live with King Kubus without fear. And I've been using films and talks to turn people on to wild animals all, all these years. And I've made several films, including for National Geographic and for BBC. Crocodile Blues was about the Gharial. Uh, Dragon Chronicles was about Komodo dragons and other wonderful creatures like that. The Million Snake Bites was about the problem of snake bite in India. And 21st Century Cats was about leopards. Leopards we found in our own backyard because just a hundred yards away from where I'm sitting right now, we have a forest and there's leopards living there. Okay, workshops for forest staff and for everybody are really important. And Ajay is the man standing right in front in the blue shirt, is the man Ajay Giri at the, at the Agumbe Research. Uh, he's the field director at the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, and he conducts these programs. We actually have to put on programs for the local police and the strategic task, task force who patrol for us. They came to us actually saying, look, sometimes we meet King Cobras and we've got our AK-47s, uh, our, our rifles and everything else. What can we do? And we try to tell him, look, you don't have to worry. The snake is not going to bother you. He might see you. And if he does, he'll go the other direction as fast as he can. 
and the people respect this, and nobody does, nobody kills king cobras there now. And education at the school levels are a lot of fun. We have videos to show them, and sometimes live snake demonstrations. And wow, they touch a snake and they say, they're not slimy at all. Can I have it? Can I have it? Like, the, the, actually, the snake, the poor snake gets tired out being prodded and poked and photographed, and everyone wants to hold it around their neck. We have to stop it after a little while. Okay, um, our snake bite mitigation project is now the, the, the main thing I'm concentrating on. It is actually the biggest human wildlife problem in India. You hear a lot about at the elephant problem, the tiger problem, the leopard problem, but snake bite is indeed a huge problem. Snakes are very essential because they eat rats. They, they're a very, very important part of our ecology and people can learn to avoid snakes. These are the basic facts. 50,000 people die from snake bite each year in India. A lot of people don't know this, but it is true. And many or more, hundreds of thousands, are permanently injured by snakes. There are actually only four kinds of snakes which cause most of the deaths, the big four, which I'll be showing you in a minute. Snake bite is definitely preventable and definitely treatable, but you must remember that antivenom is the only cure because there are many other purported cures but they are not effective. They are just a big waste of time. Okay, the Russell's viper is number one. This is a snake which blends into its surroundings very well. It comes close to human habitations because it's a rat eater. It's a large viper. The cobra you all know. Cobra is the most famous snake in the world, probably because of snake charmers. And I don't know, it, it, it is truly a very beautiful snake. It's worshiped almost throughout the country. And you can find icons of cobras in almost any temple you go to throughout the country. The crate is a, a, a snake of the night. It's a fairly large snake. It grows to about a meter long, a little bit more. It's jet black with white cross bands, and it's only out at night, but it has a very toxic venom. The sawscale viper, although this photograph doesn't really tell you what, how big it is, is a tiny snake. It's only 10 or 15 inches long, and it's incredibly common in some areas. Along the coastline of Maharashtra, for example, where the laterite rocky tableland is found, that's where it's very, very common. It's a snake of the open areas. It's not found in the forests at all. It's very small, but it has a very toxic venom. Okay, we have you know, tried to uh, do education programs and we think preventing snake bite is the way to solve the problem. And just by telling people that most snakes are harmless, they avoid humans, if you use a torch at night, if people just would use a light at night, probably 50% of snake bites would be stopped overnight. Sleep using a mosquito net, especially if you sleep on the ground or on a mat on the floor. Snakes eat rats, so keep rats away. That makes a lot of sense. And the main lesson here is that if someone is bitten, get to the hospital and get the only remedy, antivenom. I keep saying this, we keep repeating it over and over again so people remember it. I'm producing, uh, to teach people about snakes, we produce a book called Snakes of India, which shows that even though we have over 300 different species of snakes in the country, only 15 of them have ever caused the death of a human, and only four of them are the very common ones the common big four venomous snakes of India, which I just showed you. So it's really important to spread the word about snakes. Because for one thing, they are our best rodent controllers. I suppose if we didn't have snakes, we'd be facing famine because rats would just overtake and eat up all of our rice and wheat and all the other grains. And of course, the lesson about always using a torch at night. Now, the guy using the torch here is obviously being careful. He sees the Russell's Viper in front of him, but notice he's wearing chapels because if he didn't use a light and he stepped on that snake, the snake would feel like it's being injured, like it's being killed. So what will he do? He'll bite in defense. That's why they bite, just in self-defense. Okay, the second step is to improve antivenom and guarantee its availability in villages. Now, this is something we are working with the antivenom producers about, and we're working with the government of India, the health ministry, to make sure that free antivenom is available where and when it's needed in rural India. And prevention is definitely the best cure. 
But if you're bitten, antivenom is the only cure. I've repeated this now three times already just in this talk. So you can imagine during the time that I'm talking to people, when we're giving a talk to a group of people in villages, we say it over and over again, antivenom. Because there are a lot of dangerous remedies out there. There are so-called remedies that they're not at all. Something called the snake stone. I mean, these, these things have been around for decades or even a hundred years. They don't do anything but make a person feel better. So with the Irla, for example, have their own herbal medicines. And I didn't say don't use it. I said use it, but use it on the way to the hospital to get antivenom. Because when a snake bites, it injects venom. So you have to get an injection to neutralize the venom. This is the lesson. And this is a fairly simple lesson to get across to people. Okay, a very important part of our work is venom sampling. We're sampling venom. This is Jerry Martin, one of my colleagues, a herpetologist and an expert snake man. And we are extracting venom from Russell's viper here, in this case was in, in Maharashtra, in Mahat. And this, this venom goes to uh, a, 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 a venom, product, a venom uh, research laboratory at the Indian Institute of Science called the Evolutionary Venomics Lab. Our colleague, Dr. Kartik Sunagar, actually is looking at the variation in venom throughout the country. This is all to improve antivenom so that when you're bitten by a snake, you get the best treatment possible. And step three, this is really very important, is to create a rural medical support. Right now, during this time of COVID-19, we all know that rural India is having a hard time and may, God forbid, have even a harder time because of the lack of medical facilities in some of our most remote areas. Recently, I heard that um, in Odisha, they have actually started providing uh, ventilators and uh, for all ambulances. And this is extremely important to have, to be able to have snake bite treatment and the correct protocol throughout rural India. Okay, the last little message is to remember that snakes are frightened of us. They really only want to be left alone. This king cobra is very happy to be sitting in front of me, but if I stood up, he'd just shoot off as fast as he could go. He just wants to keep away from me. Thanks very much. And uh, these are some of the organizations, including USV, who are supporting our work, particularly on snake bite. And uh, I wanted to show you that, I wanted to uh, tell you that this is the link that if you can copy this down and go to the madrascrocodilebank.org link, you can source these uh, venom, uh, these uh, short films about venomous snakes, about snake bite. And one in particular you'll very much like is Living with the King, all about King Cobras. And I think now we can open up for questions and answers, am I right? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Rom. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, especially for that very emphatic message that uh, snakes bite because they are simply trying to defend themselves. And right. Right. I hope it busts a lot of myths and, uh, uh, you know, reduces a bit of fear that uh, people, some people have for snakes. Yep. Yeah, because when one sees 50,000 bites in a year and then, you know, one hears that uh, snakes are not harmful, somehow those two statements don't seem to go together. Uh, but as you said, it's just simple precautions and it's a lot of common sense that yep. can bring those numbers down drastically. So I do have a number of questions and I'm going to ask them on behalf of people because otherwise it might get a bit Great. chaotic. So Great. let me start with... Um, Okay, so let me start with the first one, Sukumar. What is the difference between a cobra and a king cobra? Okay, that's a, an interesting question because a lot of people confuse it. A king cobra is actually not one of the true cobras. In, in the world, there are probably about 20 different species of cobras, both in Africa and Asia. The king cobra is one species alone. It's got a completely different genus. And although it spreads a hood, it, it's, it's in its own family. So. Uh, there are a lot of differences, of course. For one thing, it's much, much bigger than any of the other uh, so-called, I mean, any of the other snakes, which we call cobras. 
but it does spread a hood. The confusion is, of course, the common name. It's called a king cobra. So that is why there is some confusion. It deserves that name. It's beautiful. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jayan says, does the female king cobra use its body to gather the leaves for the nest? The king cobra, the, actually watching the, the, the snake gathering leaves is quite incredible because it uses its body. I mean, here's a, an animal without any hands or feet, and it's able to actually gather leaves up. So that one that I showed you, the nest that I showed you, took her two weeks. She actually gathers it, and I'm not sure if you can see how I'm doing this, but she gathers it in a coil of her uh, body, a, a bunch of leaves, and this drags it up to the top of the nest. She keeps doing this and doing this, and it's very frustrating to watch her because sometimes she'll be gathering a, 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 a whole clump of leaves, and then she'll run into a, a twig, and the leaves just fall away. But she still thinks she's got them, and she goes to the top of the, the nest without any leaves at all. You, you, it almost makes you, when you're watching, it makes you think, well, I'll go there and help her and pack up some leaves for her. Uh, from Jitendra Jalan, how could city dwellers uh, yeah, here we go. How could city dwellers get more awareness about reptiles and con uh, contribute to their conservation? I think uh, that little link which I showed you earlier, and if you have a difficulty in finding it, you can always contact us at the Madras Crocodile Bank. But showing these videos, I think, is a very important thing to get across to people. Yeah. Uh, from Supratev Ganguly, if the king cobra bites another king cobra during a fight. Will the other cobra die? That's a really good question. I, and it, it has happened and we have seen it and we've noticed that the king cobra that gets bitten doesn't die. So it's very clear that they have a very high resistance both to their own venoms and it seems to the venom of other snakes because we've seen king cobras getting bitten by common cobras, by spectacle cobras without it, uh, apparently no effect at all. So they seem to have a very high resistance to the, their own venom, as well as the venom of other snakes. It makes a lot of sense too, since they're snake eaters. Uh, Suprativ Ganguly, again, if bitten by a snake, what is an immediate first aid before rushing to hospital? Well, I mean, the, the, the point is to immunize, uh, sorry, immobilize the, uh, the limb which is bitten, it's usually either the leg or the hand which is bitten. So it's very important that there's nothing done like cutting and sucking and tying a tourniquet and all of this stuff is very dangerous. It's very important to just completely immobilize that limb. If the person is far away from a vehicle, he or she should be carried to the vehicle. And, and another very important thing is to keep calm and to make sure the pe person doesn't panic, which will speed up his heart and speed up uh, the rate of spread of the venom. So it's very important to keep calm and get to the hospital as fast as possible, any kind of vehicle. Thanks, Ram. And a similar question was asked by Habib Ashraf. Uh, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. And uh, here's something that's really interesting for people to know. And Dr. Rahul Kadam asked this. How do we identify whether a bite is from a venomous snake or a non-venomous one? That's a very important question, and it's not an easy thing to answer. For one thing, if you're bitten by uh, a, a snake like a Russell's viper or a Saskia viper or a cobra, any of those three, there will probably be immediate pain and swelling will start quite quickly. So that's one way you can tell. If someone's bitten at night by a crate, it's a little more difficult because the bite is not very painful or hardly painful at all. And that's why when someone's bitten by a snake at night, we say, don't wait around for symptoms, get them to the hospital because it could have been a crate bite. But the other three species, when they bite, it's pretty obvious that you've been bitten by a venomous snake because of the pain. Anyway, don't take a chance. If you can't identify the snake and a bite happens, it's still worth it, get to the hospital. And the hospital will be able to identify the bite, the nature of the bite, whether it's venomous or not? The point is the antivenom which is made for the bites of the big four are, is suitable, is good. It's polyvalent, it's called. It's good for all the big four. So the doctor usually will have experience, uh, rural doctors in particular should have experience to know 
the symptoms of what happens after a bite happens. And depending on the symptoms, they will give the appropriate dosage of antibiotics. Okay. Uh, Gajanan Nam Joshi asks, are snakes also uh, bred in order to get venom? And do they reproduce in an artificially created environment? They do. Uh, it's very, that's a good question because right now the Irla Cooperative, which catches its snakes from the wild uh, to, to extract the venom and then releases them back to the wild, has been informed that the World Health Organization actually has informed us that they're going to have to start breeding snakes in captivity and producing venom from captive snakes rather than wild caught snakes. So yes, they do breed very well and there are venom production centers in Australia, in America, and Europe which produce venom only from captive bred snakes. So while we get okay. there, there's Mandar Sule who says, unlike in the Amazon forest, does the anaconda exist in India? And do they have a habit of swallowing humans? Uh, <laughs> okay, so while we are talking of the, uh, the Amazon, uh, maybe I can add a little piece of my own to this question. Uh, could you tell us about the snakes of Africa versus India versus South America, please? Okay, I can do that. Uh, obviously, we don't have any anacondas in the wild in India, but if you come to the Madras Crocodile Bank, you can see green anacondas and yellow anacondas. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't actually heard of one, a real story of one swallowing a human being, but it's perfectly wow. possible. Reticulated pythons in, in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia have swallowed people, and you may have seen something online fairly recently that a person was swallowed by one of these reticulated pythons. As far as uh, snakes go, well, all tropical parts of the world, Africa, South America, and Asia, have an array of different species of snakes. And uh, I think India has one of the highest numbers. Uh, I think the whole Af African continent probably has uh, close to 500 different species of snakes. And India is much smaller than the African continent and we've got 300 different species of snakes. Africa has many different kinds of cobras, whereas in India, we only have four different species of cobras. South America, of course, has no cobras at all. And uh, the main venomous snakes there are the pit vipers. And they've got a huge pit viper there called a the Bushmaster, which grows to nearly 10 feet long. and uh, this is, as a pit viper goes, this is one of the, and it is the biggest in the world. So, uh, yeah, there are, it, it's a fascinating and very complicated subject because there are just so many hundreds and hundreds of different snakes. I've had the pleasure of going to both Africa and South America and had some experience, but not as much experience as I've had here in, in the rest of Asia. So, uh, just a little extension to that question, the venomous ones are always the most interesting. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about those uh, those very exciting snakes like the boomslang, the uh, black mamba, the taipan, which we hear about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I've had experience with a few of them. Uh, I, I was in Namibia not too long ago, and I saw a whole bunch of birds dive bombing something in a tree, and I said, "Aha! Something's going on there, and I bet you it's a snake." And sure enough, it was a boomslang. Well, I climbed up into the tree and uh, I, I wanted to take the snake down so that I could get photographs of it and kind of save it from it being savaged by the birds. So I, I, I was holding on to the branch with one arm and holding the tail of the snake with the other. And then I realized, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, <laughs> I have to climb down the tree. So I just dropped the snake down and went running down and, and got my photograph on the ground. It was kind of embarrassing to the people who were watching, but uh, yeah. In in, uh, in Australia, yeah. Go ahead, Ron. Okay, yeah. In Australia, I um, where the taipan is found. This is an incredible snake. I actually found them in Papua New Guinea, and uh, it's a very fast snake. Again, it's frightened of humans, but it's a, a very intimidating thing because if you grab it by the tail, it doesn't want to just push off and go away the way a king cobra does, it comes straight at you and it's very fast. So it's pretty scary. And uh, yeah, you have to have your wits around you and you, you have to be a bit younger than I am now <laughs> to be able to handle them safely. Um, the black mamba, I've never run into a black mamba in the wild. I've seen them in captivity, 
But uh, that is certainly one of the most impressive snakes. And again, a large snake. It grows to, again, almost 10 feet long. And so it's approaching the size of a king cobra. Again, uh, there are a lot of stories about snakes like the black mamba and the taipan. Most of them not true. Most of them just uh, you know, glorifying how dangerous they are and how deadly they are and how they want to bite you. But again, in general, every place that I've been and every experience I've had with these snakes is that they're very frightened of humans and just want to stay away from us. I'm glad you can keep repeating that lesson. Uh, so here's a question from Sudhir Thatte. Where does the snake store the venom in its body? Okay, a snake has a, a modified salivary glands right in its cheeks. So you see a bulge on the side of a snake, particularly in a, a Russell's viper, you can see actually a slight bulge on both sides where, where we have cheeks. It has these venom glands. And these glands produce venom over a period of time. And they, each one has a small uh, tube, which actually leads to the fang. And probably most of you know that the fangs are hollow, just like injection needles. And the little tube, which leads from the venom gland to the fang, when the snake bites the muscles in its cheeks, so to speak, around the venom gland, squeeze the venom gland, and the venom shoots out of the tip of the fang, very, very much like uh, a, a hypodermic needle. When you see a doctor uh, flipping out a little bit of uh, his serum from the front of a needle, it's, the, the venom comes out very much like that. Could you tell us about yes. the fry bite? Yeah, that's a very interesting subject. Uh, a lot of people get bitten by snakes, and I can tell you I, I had one myself. I, uh, a Russell's viper fang punctured my thumb once, and I, the first thing I said, oh my God, now I've got it. But nothing happened, and uh, that was because the snake didn't inject venom. When a snake bites, it, it's voluntary whether it wants to inject venom or not, and depending on how much uh, how excited he is or how frightened or injured he is, he might give more venom or less venom or no venom at all. I've been with two people when we were catching venomous snakes and actually saw them with my own eyes getting what I considered very serious bites with both fangs on their hands. And we, we all of us said, oh my gosh, now we have to wait, we have to get to the hospital. We waited about half an hour or an hour on the way to the hospital actually in one case and there was no symptom at all. The snake had not injected any venom at all. And this is what we call a dry bite. So very often a snake might bite, even if it's a venomous snake, there could be no effects at all. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to the hospital because it's important to be at the hospital in case it wasn't a dry bite. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so Suki Valia says, uh, is there a common helpline number in case a snake is spotted in a residential area? Um, yeah, I guess it's for other parts of India because uh, your people are doing very good work in the South. Yeah, almost every uh, city, I, I think you have to go online to find this, but almost every city, I know Bombay for, Mumbai for sure, has many snake rescuers. And Maharashtra, I think, has more snake rescuers in one state than the entire country put together. So almost anywhere you are, you can find your local um, snake rescuer. Uh, so just, I'm, I'm going to just add to this question a bit, uh, you know, in Mumbai and in our corporate office in the garden, we sometimes find Kilba, uh, Dhaman, um, what else have we found? We found, um, yeah, pretty much I think these two snakes. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember if we've seen a cobra, maybe. Uh, we do call the Sarpamitra. Uh, but how do you know who is a genuine Sarpamitra who will release the snake safely back into the forest? Because uh, to me, it's more important that they release the snake safely and that they don't keep it and play around with it like yeah. it's a yeah. and show off. That's very true. And a lot of people are asking us, is there any training program that we can take? And we have, in fact, done training programs, both at Agombe as well as the Madras Crocodile Bank. And I know that people uh, in, in Pune are doing training uh, for snake rescuers. And I, I believe the forest department has to certify them as people who will definitely catch the snake safely and not do some stupid Facebook picture by kissing the cobra or some ridiculous thing like that. 
but this is really a very important thing and i think we have to regularize this all over india because uh, and also, let me just say that um, there's really no point in translocating a rat snake like a daman or, or a keelback or any of these non-venomous snakes. It's better to leave the snake right there. That's if you remove right. the that's, snake, that's if you do, yeah. That's what we do now, Rom. We don't yeah. relocate. So we do have them and we coexist with them. Yeah. And they're completely safe. They're completely so safe. We, so are we. Yeah, absolutely. And they eat rats. And if you remove a non-venomous snake, the chances are a venomous snake might move into that habitat where he's just been removed from. It's better that we learn to identify snakes and get along with them. And a lot of people, are, it's, it's getting better and better. Uh, so here's uh, Mahesh Pandit. Which is the biggest snake reported till date and how big is it? Are they still, are they still found today? Yeah, the largest, the longest snake ever recorded was the, is the reticulated python. And uh, Indonesia has the record size for it. It's nearly uh, close to about nine meters, nearly 30 feet in length. I've seen one which was 26 feet long uh, at, a, at a zoo. And it was kept in captivity for all those years and uh, grew very, very much bigger than usually in the wild once they get to a huge size. They become very conspicuous and very vulnerable. But yeah, the reticulated python is the largest species of snake in the world. Longest species. Ramesh from Nepal wants to know, why do snakes enter houses of people during the night? Yeah, that's a very interesting question and very important as regarding the crate, because crates come into people's houses at night, usually searching for rodents, which they eat. But if someone is sleeping on the ground or on the floor and a snake crawls near it and the person hits at it or moves around or even rolls over on it and squashes it, the crate might bite him. And this, is, this, this can be very bad because if you're bitten at night by a crate, and I think I told you a little earlier, the bite is not very painful. And so there's no urgency to get to a hospital. But anyone who gets bitten at night by a snake must get to the hospital quickly because it could be a great bite. Dr. Amal wants to know, I wonder why our literature and our mythologies are so critical and so defaming of the snakes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that that is my question as well. I, I completely, uh, Well, yeah, it's very true. And, and luckily, uh, it, it's in the, it, we've got a, a strange dichotomy in India because we worship snakes, uh, but a, a lot of times we hate snakes at the same time, or we fear them. So we're we're lucky in the sense that uh, we have uh, you know a reverence for snakes in India. But uh, there are other religions. Christianity even calls a snake evil in its in its holy book as well. So even from way back, thousands of years ago, snakes are treated like that, are considered to be evil. But uh, now I think things are changing. Things are getting much. Education is helping us a lot. And uh, a lot of the films that we do, for example, seem to have turned on quite a few people in a positive way. I, I think we just have to keep at it, which I've been doing. When I was little, I was probably quite an obnoxious little kid because I used to tell adults, grown-ups, well, snakes are nice. Why are you worried about it? Why are you scared of them? <laughs> I can imagine them saying, shut up, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Rom, I think I was not too different. <laughs> but but uh, here's a question from Joel. Uh, what's the recent research on snake venom? On snake venom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you can, uh, uh, there's a lot of research on it. But uh, what I was telling you earlier, the uh, Evolution of Venomics Lab in, in the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore is producing some fantastic results, finding out how different venoms are throughout the country. I think that's the most important finding, that even in Maharashtra alone, we collected venom samples from five different districts a couple of years ago in Maharashtra, and he's found that the cobra venom from five different districts is quite different, one district to the other. This means a lot for the production of antivenom. That means antivenom has to be produced using venom collected from throughout the country. This is a very important point and, and something which the venom researchers are addressing right now. Mahesh Pandit says, do snakes die a natural death? What's their normal lifespan? 
yeah, smaller snakes like striped keelbacks and checkered keelbacks, water snakes, live perhaps eight or 10 years. We had a king cobra that lived for 32 years in captivity and a python which lived over 30 years as well. I've heard of other pythons which had lived almost 50 years. So it seems like the larger species of snakes live a longer time, but that's roughly what we, we only really know from captive snakes, not from wild snakes. Uh, Sukumar wants to know within what time should snake antivenom be administered uh, for a bite? What's the outer time limit? Yeah, that is a very loaded question in the sense that it's hard to answer. The main answer to that is as soon as possible. Um, that's why uh, it's very important that ambulances uh, or at least some form of transport gets from the village to the hospital as quickly as it can. We usually say within an hour or two, antivenom has to be started. Um. And there's, there's loads of questions pouring in, Ram. I'm so happy that you've generated so much curiosity. Uh, sure. It's nice to see. Uh, Dr. Chetan Doshi wants to know, is snake venom used for any medicinal purpose? There's a lot of research that has suggested it's used for medicinal purpose. And he heads our R&D, so naturally this question would be from him. Yeah, there are, there are many uses uh, of venom for different medical products, for example, uh, they found that the coagulating properties of certain kinds of vipers are excellent uh, in blood coagulation. A, a derivative of, of Russell's viper venom called Stipven was used uh, as, uh, to stop bleeding in dental surgery, for example. And a derivative of cobra venom, which, causes, uh, uh, which affects the nerves, has been used as a non-addictive uh, pain reliever in, the, uh, in, in lieu of opiates, for example. There's a lot of research being done in, in this area. Incredibly interesting. Uh, okay, this is, uh, there is another question coming in uh, until it co comes in. Um, could you tell us a little bit, and this is from me, uh, about the life of a snake catcher, especially somebody like Ajay, uh, because I have the greatest deal of respect for the work he does. Uh, yeah. You know, I've seen him. Uh, capture king cobras, several of them, and the kind of nerves of steel, steady hand, courage, um, all of that is just incredible. Yeah, I, and the job he does to save snakes. I, 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 I'm 100% with you on that one because uh, I, I've seen so many of the snake captures by people who don't really know what they're doing or who want to make themselves look like heroes. And it's just ridiculous and dangerous uh, as compared to Ajay, who is probably one of the coolest and calmest snake catchers you, you can imagine. What's very interesting about that is also that the snake responds and reacts in the same way. If you are uh, you know, freaking out and grabbing the snake and making a big hullabaloo around it and jumping around and making yourself look like a hero, chances are the snake is going to be even more frightened and more defensive harder to catch, and chances are a bite could happen. That's why uh, Ajay is basically self-taught. Uh, he, he he's been working at the uh, Gombe Rainforest Research Station for the last 11 years. But prior to that, he was a snake rescuer in Maharashtra and uh, then joined us then. And he just naturally evolved. I mean, of course, in Maharashtra, he was catching smaller snakes, cobras and vipers and stuff like that. But he naturally evolved into one of the best king cobra rescuers I could, I could ever hope to imagine. Do people like this have any insurance because it's a very risky job? Almost definitely, yeah. A uh, question from Sudhir Thatte, again, interesting one. In India, snakes are considered guards of property. Vastu Purus. Is it a myth or is it true? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get what she had said. In India, snakes are considered Guardians of property. Uh, they're called Vastu Purus. Uh, okay. Is that true or is this a myth? Uh, it sounds like a nice myth. Uh, and it's great for the movies, but uh, in reality, uh, people have actually used snakes for, the, for this, you know, to, to you know, put snakes amongst their treasures and stuff like that. But uh, it's, it's not, it, it is more of a myth than anything else. A nice story. Uh, Ramesh Dhan says, how can I keep snakes out of my yard? 
uh, a high wall. <laughs> uh, it depends on, well, actually, if you have a lot of uh, debris lying around, a, a lot of uh, leaves, for example, can be raked up. And if there are a lot of rodents around, it's very likely the snakes are going to be around. If you keep rodents away, chances are snakes are not going to be very interested in being in your place. Tapash Tata says, which is the most venomous snake in India? In India? You did mention, yeah. As far as we know, yeah, the crate probably has the most toxic venom of any snake in India. There's one more question coming in, Ram. Uh, you've been extremely patient uh, with answering so many, but uh, can we wait for one more? It's just coming in. Please, go ahead. Yeah, I can see someone's punching it. In the, in the meantime, uh, is this radio uh, tracking program still continue? Or it is. It is. It's very interesting you ask that. I should have told you that, that uh, the local police and uh, the other authorities have considered this an essential service. So Ajay is allowed to go and catch King Cobras, but he has to completely mask himself up, gloves, the whole works. And he always uh, says in advance, if I'm coming to your house, to catch a king cobra, I don't want anyone else there. Only the household owner can be there. Nobody else can come because usually a group of people, sometimes a hundred people show up for one of these snake rescues. So yes, it's still going on. Oh, she says, uh, does the snake feel suffocated or uneasy in the closed snake bag, in, in the bag in which you capture it? That's a good question. It's, it's uh, very important that uh, we actually I can remember when we're using the cloth to make a bag, we hold it over our faces and make sure we can breathe through it very carefully. But once we had a horrible experience where um, someone caught a snake and there was, it was very hot weather, so he wet the bag down. And by wetting a bag down, you're actually locking the air and the snake suffocated inside. So that was a very important lesson to learn. But otherwise, no, a bag is a very good thing for a snake to be in because it's dark and the snake feels more secure in darkness. Could you also bust this myth for us because people pour milk on a snake, water on a snake, uh, uh, you know, so uh, this is festival time. So yeah. could you tell us what happens to the snake? Well, I mean, people used to bring milk to the snake, to Madras Snake Park to feed to the snakes. And uh, well, of course, everyone else got the milk. The snakes don't drink milk naturally in the wild. They drink water only. And uh, I'm sure a pussycat would love the milk, but not a snake. Yeah, so, so let's take this last one. Uh, it's from Karim. Eptifibatide is one of the Daman products made from venom of the southeastern pygmy rattlesnake. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us about this pygmy rattlesnake since we have a product that's made from the venom? Yeah, I don't know the product that you're talking about, but uh, I do know the snake. The snake. Very well. Yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a tiny little rattlesnake. It's very much like our saw scale viper, about the same size. It is a rattlesnake, it has a rattle, but it's only about 10 or 15 inches long. And we used to find them quite commonly in South Florida where I lived for a while. And uh, yeah. It's a very pretty little snake. Thanks, Rom. And a final message from you? I just keep safe and happy is all I can say at this very strange time for all of us. But uh, I'm glad there's so much interest and excitement. And I think uh, what should generate this more is, is go to our, our link to the Madras Crocodile Bank and see some of these videos because that'll lead you to into other things too, just as interesting. Thanks very much, everybody, for it. For, for, that was for fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and if I can take the opportunity of asking whether one of these days our strategy team can come to Agumbe uh, so. and spend some time. You have to promise to give us a, one king cobra for each of our backyards. <laughs> but, that and we we'll come on it. that condition. But no, we, I think we'd love to. Uh, so thank you. That was fascinating. And thanks for clearing so many misconceptions, for educating us, for also making it so entertaining and inspiring. Thanks for this opportunity. It's wonderful for me too.
Thank you. And with that, be safe, Rom. Be safe, everyone. And uh, it's been a wonderful evening. Thank you and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks, Rom.